So my name is Aleko Simoni. I'm working here at Imperial College. And today I will talk on behalf of Target Malaria about our mosquito control programs uh, using gene drives. Uh, this is a brief uh, outline of my talk. So I will just mention why we need another solution to eliminate malaria. I will not focus much about this because we already know why. I will talk a bit about our technology, gene drives and sex distorters, and then our uh, project implementation and a bit about stakeholder engagement. So first of all, what is Target Malaria? So Target Malaria is a non-for-profit research consortium which includes scientists like myself. I am a molecular biologist. We have protein engineers, medical entomologists, population biologists, social scientists. And then we have risk, regulatory, and community engagement advisors. We are working with partners from Africa, Europe, and North America. And we are working on a unique way to um, eliminate or reduce population of malaria mosquitoes. And what we are developing is a technology that will be freely available, so free, licensely, licensed, uh, for use by authorities in countries where the, te the technology will be um, approved. So uh, we know the numbers about malaria. Malaria is still uh, a huge problem. But uh, in the last 15 years, we saw a very big reduction in malaria mortality and morbidity. This is a picture of uh, Africa and, and malaria in 2000 and 2015. And you see that many areas became blue, and also the red areas decreased. And this was possible thanks, uh, so the reduction of malaria mortality was possible thanks to a big uh, increase in investment in malaria. But still, many, many challenges are facing uh, malaria. And the main one, I think, is resistance. Uh, we heard this morning about the spread of um, uh, drug resistance, and then there is insecticide resistance spreading uh, almost all over the world. There is a big funding gap um, from the current investment and the WHO uh, global strategy targets. There is almost a $3 billion funding gap per year to, to implement controls to uh, methods to control malaria. And we know there are political stability problems in many countries where malaria is, uh, uh, is a big issue. And there, there are infrastructure, logistical, geographical problems, entomological problems. And we just heard the challenges to develop vaccines which are uh, effective. That's why we are uh, proposing a new technology which is based on genetic control. And a genetic control is essentially a reduction of a burden of a vector bone disease by <coughs> reducing the disease by uh, a release of modified insects. And there are essentially two approaches to uh, a genetic control. One is a population suppression, which is a uh, a release of modified insects which have somehow a reduced fertility. And while those modified insects replace the population, they suppress the population. So you end up with a population crash. Another approach is a population replacement, the one that George just mentioned, where you introduce in a population mosquitoes which are somehow refractory to the parasite or they block transmission. And while they replace the wild population, they reduce the transmission of the disease. Target malaria at the moment is working only on population suppression. And we are targeting only few mosquitoes. So in Africa, there are more than 800 species of mosquitoes. And not all of them transmit malaria. Actually, very few of those transmit malaria. And they are all from the genus Anopheles, as you know. And the main responsible for malaria transmission and essentially uh, three, sorry, uh, Anopheles gambi, Caluzzi, and Orbiensis. And uh, we are working on those three species at the moment. Um, there are two ways that we are developing uh, to suppress a population. One is based on making the female sterile. So imagine if we are a modified mosquitoes marked in red. If the modified mosquito is a male, when it's crossed for female, you have a normal uh, number of progeny. But when the fame is modified, you don't have any progeny. So the female are sterile. The other approach that we are developing is based on the distortion of the sex ratio. That means that when a modified male cross to a female, instead of having 50% males and females, you have only a male progeny. And males don't transmit the disease. And then this will also lead to a population crash because of a shortage of females. And we are developing both approaches in parallel. So the moment is not clear which one will be favored, and it's likely that both together will be implemented. 
But how can you spread a modification which can be useful for malaria uh, control into a wider population? And this is possible thanks to uh, what we call gene drives. Gene drives is essentially a modification that allows uh, a gene to be spread within a population. So imagine what happens with a normal gene, a known gene drive. Since um, mosquitoes, like many individuals, have two copies of each gene, and one is inherited from the mother and one from the father, from the father that means that every gene has a 50% chance to be inherited. And therefore, this is true for generation after generation, and therefore the frequency of the gene that you introduce in a population will stay constant over time, and is actually likely to be decreased because of gene drift and other mechanisms. So essentially, uh, a modification doesn't increase in frequency unless it carries a very strong advantage, a selection uh, advantage. A gene drive, instead, is a mechanism that allows a modification, a gene, to be inherited all the time. And this is through generation after generation. And therefore, in few generations, a modification can replace a whole target population. And therefore, the frequency of this modification increases quickly over time, up to a point that it can replace completely a wild type of population. But how does this work? So this is a, um, a schematic of uh, what happens usually with a normal, say, a modification, which is known a gene drive, as, say, a Mendelian inheritance. Since a modification is present in only one of the two chromosomes, indicated here in, in the red square, and the mosquitoes has two chromosomes, the progeny will inherit, only half of the progeny will inherit the modification, and you can see in the progeny that only half will be modified. A gene drive changes this uh, paradigm, and um, this is based on expression of nucleases, which are DNA cutting enzymes, that are able to copy it over from one chromosome to another in a process called homing. So essentially it's a site-specific nuclease, very specific, that cleaves the chromosome in the same site where the nuclease is inserted. And then it explores the repair machinery of the cells to be copied over using homologous recombination. And when this happens, all the gametes will inherit the modification and all the progeny will be modified. In this way, it can increase in frequency over generation and it can replace a population. But how can you transfer this knowledge to malaria control? Imagine that you put this gene drive, this nuclease, inside a mosquito gene, and in doing so, you can destroy the function of the gene. If the gene is important, for instance, for the fertility of the females, for instance, in the process to produce eggs, while you destroy this gene, you can destroy the ability of the females to produce eggs. And while this nuclease, this gene drive, spread within a population, you can reduce the, the overall population fitness to a point that you can reduce the population number to a level that don't transmit the disease. We tested this in the lab. Uh, we uh, isolated three genes, three genomic loci that when targeted, they uh, block um, the ability of females to produce eggs. And then we saw how much uh, those gene drives inserted in those loci can be transferred to the progeny. What you see here, this is the number of um, mosquito transgene for each of those loci. And you see that a normal gene will be transmitted only 50% of the times. In our gene drives, we have transmission up to 99% of the time. So we're very, very efficient. A medical model predicted this to spread within a few years. But what we observed in the lab when we actually released those mosquitoes inside a small population cages, we saw there were a quick spread initially and then a decline on the frequency of the gene drives. And this was due to resistance that were arising inside the population cage. This was actually predicted and anticipated, and our models also predict quite nicely the rise of resistance. And at the moment, we are working hard to try to find ways to limit, to mitigate uh, a rise of resistance. We have several approaches that we are exploring to mitigate resistance. The second approach that we are developing is um, a sex distortion towards male. And the way 
that this is done is quickly explained in this slide. So um, we can express transgene specifically in different uh, body tissues in the mosquitoes. What you see here, this is a testis, a fluorescent testis. So we can express effectors, or molecules, or nucleases specifically during spermatogenesis. And uh, in mosquitoes, the sex is determined by the sex chromosomes. Like in human, if you have a Y uh, chromosome, you are a male. If you have a X, you are a female. And then we are exploiting a peculiarity of the mosquito genome to have um, a sequence, a DNA sequence, exclusively present on the X chromosome, which is repeated at a very high number. There are more than 300 copies of this gene exclusively on the X chromosome. We can design a nuclease that cleaves this sequence. And in doing so, if this is happens during spermatogenesis, we can destroy the sperms that contain the X chromosome because only the X chromosome contains this sequence. As a consequence, only the sperm that carries the Y chromosome survives, and this leads only to male progeny, because the male is determined by the presence of the Y. This has been done in the lab, and we achieve uh, a male progeny of 95%, so this is very efficient, and then we are trying to transfer this in a context of a gene drive to spread this uh, phenotype within a population. Uh, now I will talk a uh, few minutes about how we want to implement this project. And uh, we are using um, a phased technology development approach, so using three different phases. The first phase is based on a sterile male, self-limiting. So those are not a gene drive. Those are essentially um, sterile male, and those, uh, therefore, they will not spread in the population, and they will not have any impact on malaria transmission but they will be used only essentially as a learning phase. The second phase will be a self-limiting male biased. Also, those are not a, a gene drive, so they will not persist for a very long time in the wild, but only for a few generations. And uh, only the third phase will be the fully gene drive, and those will provide a, a long-term and sustainable impact on a, a malaria a mosquito number. For each of the phases, we are... Um, doing several tests. The first will be a development and test in uh, near London, Imperial, in a container laboratory. Then they will be transferred in Italy, where they will be tested in large cages. Then there will be also some off-continent safety studies on the safety of the mosquitoes. They will be then transferred to Africa, where the mosquito will be tested in contained facilities in Africa. And only after that, they will be uh, released in small cage, uh, small scale uh, in Africa. And this will be the same for every of the three phases. The current state of progress, so where we are at the moment uh, on this project, so for the sterile male construct, those have been already developed already in the lab, it's been ready for many years, and now they've been imported in Burkina Faso, one of our <coughs> African partners, excuse me, back in uh, November 2016 and they have been working in containment, in containment since then. We have at the moment application for, um, for import in Mali and also in Uganda uh, soon next year. The self-limiting uh, construct, they also have been developed already in the lab, and uh, they will be the next phase to be imported in Burkina, in Mali, and Uganda uh, in the next couple of years. And the final constant, the gene drive constant, is still under development in the lab. We are making very good progress, but the technology is not ready yet to be uh, imported and tested in Africa. Few words to, fi uh, to finalize my presentation is about our stakeholder engagement. This is a big part of our project, so we not only have the scientific uh, part, but also uh, the stakeholder engagement, which has been going in parallel, so we are not waiting until to have a product ready to be uh, deployed, so we are actively uh, engaging uh, different stakeholders. And the objective of our stakeholder, stakeholder engagement is, first of all, to reach consent, um, both for entomological collection and also on a community acceptance in, in the countries where the technology will be used to ensure uh, acceptance of the project and also uh, a public knowledge and also to co-develop the technology with the stakeholders. So we are not just, in, just go there and, and give the technology. We want to, to gather input from the stakeholders and co-develop the technology together. 
And this is also in a process to be completely uh, transparent and systematic in every steps of our uh, project development. And since stakeholder, stakeholder can be at very different levels, can be an international level, can be a pan-African level, or can be down to national, regional, or very community level, we have different approaches and tactics to approach all the stakeholders. We have challenges also regarding this uh, approach because uh, it's not always easy to identify which are the main key stakeholders and then also to maintain the debate closer to the people that at the end will benefit at most of this technology because sometimes the decisions are taken of the people that at the end will benefit of the technology. And then it's also important to find the right balance between engaging proactively and also not overimposing the technology while it is still under development. And then obviously to keep in, an informed decision making a discussion about the technology, about the risks and the benefit, and to ensure that the inputs of the stakeholders are taken into consideration at all different stages. And then I would like to, to finish with um, a point which I think is very important that uh, the technology that we are developing uh, is not a silver bullet. Uh, sometimes in the last <coughs> year or so, there's been in many discussion a very uh, hype about gene drives. Of course, it's a very powerful technology, it's very innovative, and it's very useful. We think that it can make an impact on malaria, but it's not the only technology that can save, uh, it can eliminate malaria. And I also take the opportunity to, to thank the inviters and um, all the people in this room to have the opportunity to be here all together, to sit around the table, and to, to find the, all the different approaches that together and only together they can help malaria to be eliminated. I would finish uh, thanking uh, our funders. The core of the project is funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and also by the Open Philanthropy Project. Thank you. Thank you, Alekos. Any question for Alekos? Well, that's a difficult question. Uh, I think at this stage, uh, there are still many uh, scientific challenges which uh, we are focusing on. Uh, and I think in the next few years, probably we will uh, solve the scientific, the scientific challenges. In terms of acceptability, uh, that's a very big open question. Uh, I think we are doing a very good work on advertising the project, which are the benefits of the project. And the response is very positive. But there are, there are challenges, yes. GM technology is always very controversial and um, it can pose challenges also for, for projects like this that have very strong benefit. But that's still a very good point. Thank you. George? Can I, can I ask about the scientific challenges? So, yes. Um, so the resistance uh, to CRISPR is yes. a major setback, I guess. Yeah. Uh, what's your predictions? I mean, what, what, what do you think? Uh, I'll show you a slide. So yes, as you said, resistance is uh, one of the main challenges that we are facing at the moment. We are working with different approaches to try to mitigate resistance. Uh, this might be a bit technical, but um, the type of uh, genes, the target site that you choose is very important in order to predict also how resistance can arise. And I think there will be a talk in the afternoon by Sam that will talk about uh, this also. Uh, we can multiplex CRISPR, so to target multiple genes or multiple sites within the genes. This would be equivalent of uh, a combinatorial approach for antibiotics or any other intervention. And this also will mitigate resistance. Or we can also choose nucleases or different type of Cas9 that target in different parts of the gene. And so you can also mitigate resistance, arise of resistance in that way. And but yes, so we have strategies to try to mitigate resistance. And um, together with mathematical model, we can predict how long the intervention must last in order to have a reduced transmission together with other methods before resistance arise and can be a problem. Um, but yeah, resistance, I think, is one of the main challenges. Because it can, it can be a challenge also. I mean, to have an impact on the, in the message that you are delivering to the, uh, to the 
stakeholders as well? Yes, well, at the moment, the technology is not ready yet. And uh, we are still uh, in the, the lab stage, so we are still developing the technology. I think that we can solve this problem and to provide a technology which can have an impact in the field uh, to delay resistance late enough to have an impact on malaria transmission. I think that's feasible, definitely. Thank you. Any other question? The last question for this session. No, it's really a, a, just a comment on resistance. It, resistance is also an opportunity because it, it can help to make this GM technology more acceptable because it's not going to be there forever as long as it's predictable resistance. Hmm. And so, as Elikos is saying, if, if the resistance is delayed long enough to get an effect, give us time to produce a new variant and then replace the original resistance yeah. one. We have the advantage of effect without the, the overwhelming foreverness of a GM technology. Yeah, I agree. Okay. We, we have to thank again all the, the speakers of this uh, section. Thank you.